Yeah, you don't have to like eat the microphone, but obviously make sure yeah. you're talking yeah. somewhat in the I general usually, my, direction of it. So. I have a voice that carries pretty well, so yeah. I think I'm I'm usually not one that has to worry about not being heard. I'm yeah. usually loud enough. <laughs> usually the the other way around. Yeah, I'm usually I'm usually too loud. That's how I am too. Every once in a while, I'll be talking in the office and I'll just like hear someone's door shut. I'm like, <laughs> oh, yeah. did it again. Yep. Did it again. So. Yeah. Well, thanks for hanging out with us today. Appreciate you taking yeah. some time, and uh, it'll be good to to get to know your story and let our YouTube audience do the same. So, Deacon Josh Miller from the Diocese of Winona, Rochester, technically. Yep. Um, that is where you will be ordained here, and you had the countdown app going. You said it's less than 24 days. Less now, than 24 days, yep. Yeah. Yeah. What's on your mind and heart as that that approaches oh we'll gosh there. um well it's it's uh it's a mix of a lot of different things um you know recently especially i've been reflecting on back when i started seminary um gosh seven years ago you know kind of where i was then and what i was thinking the lord's plan for my life was and you know it was a really big like step just getting into seminary it was like a whole new adventure and there's kind of that same sense now of you know I've been I've been planning and training and preparing for for something for seven years and now that I'm about to go do it and I'm about to enter this whole new you know vocation yeah. of of parish life and it's it's exciting and it's also a little bit like wow, I have no idea what's coming next, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, and it, and there's, yeah, there's just, there's also been this, like, you know, with that, just reflecting on on what it is that I will be doing, you know, what a what a privilege it is and how how unworthy I am mm -hmm. of just the the reality of the Sacrament of Holy Orders. But at the same time, um, you know, I gave my yes to Jesus and, and it, you know, it's kind of in, inevitable for me. It's like, I'm going to do what he asked me to do. And so whatever that means, yeah. I don't know what it's going to mean, but whatever that is, I'm going to do it. So it's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's exciting. Is there some, some anxiety that comes with the unknown or, or peace because you've, you've taken, you know, you took the plunge to go to seminary, yeah. <laughs> transitional deacon, which comes with its own set of commitments that you mm -hmm. made about a year ago. So maybe it's not to put words in your mouth, but a, but a mix, a mix of things, I suppose. Yeah, it, it's. It, I, I would say it's. There's some a little bit of anxiety, and and it's not like a a nervous anxiety as much as it's like an excited anxiety. Sure. Because I mean, even even right now, <laughs> I've been waiting to find out my first assignment, yeah. so I still don't know yet, and uh, I don't even know where exactly I'm going to be staying here when school ends. Yeah. Um, but I know it's coming and whatever, whatever, you know, the Lord and the Bishop have planned for me, um, I'm just looking forward to getting started. So it's, yeah, it's kind of like the, the anxious, anxiety, anxi excited anxiety of like the unknown. Yeah. Um, I don't know what it's going to be like. And I don't want to, you know, don't know what kind of challenges are going to be a part of it, but, uh, I'm looking forward to the challenge and and you know all the the newness of of being a priest. So. Yeah, it's all part of the adventure, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about the beginning of of the adventure. That's a better segue than I normally come up with off the <laughs> top of my head. I am overly proud of myself right now. Check my pride. <laughs> um, now you you're from Wasika, Minnesota. Yep. Originally, tell us about kind of your upbringing. You come from a farming background. Or yeah. Something? So. Um, when I was born, I was actually born in California. Uh, my dad was in the army, and three months after I was born, him and my mom decided that they didn't want to raise their family in the military. Sure. And so, uh, talked to grandpa, and dad bought the farm from grandpa, just uh, wow. about six miles north of Wasika, and that's where I grew up. Um, so yeah, I've got. Uh, I we dad they don't live there anymore, but one of my cousins still runs the farm and. Uh, most of my uh, extended family is within, you know, two, three hours of Wasika. It's pretty, you know. Tight knit. Pretty, pretty close for yeah. family yeah. groups. So. You have siblings? I do. I have four sisters. Okay. Yeah. And they're all younger than you? They are all younger okay. than me, yep. Um, one of them is in Burnsville, 
and one of them is in Wasika. Uh, one of them is in the Air Force. She's in Georgia right now. And then the youngest one is in college down in um, Ames, Iowa. Okay. So, so spread out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Do you... Um did you always kind of want to follow in dad's footsteps as far as your military service or um, maybe not that not simple? Yeah, not, I wouldn't say always. It, it yeah. was, it was always something I was attracted to. And yeah. at a certain point, you know, when I was in high school, I was like, it's, it sounds like fun. It's an adventure, <laughs> you know, you can, yeah. And I, and it was something that I, I thought that I would be good at hmm. just especially I just like to be outside and sure. camping and hunting and fishing and just stuff like that. And, and it was also a call to, uh, service. Mm. You know, I wanted, I wanted to do something that was, that had a mission that was like going to make a difference in the world. And so that was part of it. And, and, um, mom and dad were insistent that I get an education. Yeah. So when I told them I wanted to enlist, they said they wouldn't, they didn't want me to do that. And so, um, you're like, fine, I'm going to West Point. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I was like, well, I I don't want to pay for an education, so let's yeah. figure out a way to not pay for an education. So, yeah, uh, yeah I was uh, I ended up going to West Point and and uh, paying for it with time rather than money. There you go. <laughs> what do you guys farm? I'm jumping around chronologically a little bit. But. We had so it was a organic farm, kind of okay. a mix of everything. We had probably oh gosh, I want to say like between fifty and seventy five head of beef. Uh, and then uh, organic soybeans and corn. We did have uh, sheep and pigs at different times, but not consistently. So okay, yeah. And did you have the classic like farm kid upbringing where you were getting up super early and and helping out and kind of you know learning yeah the, the, so the ethic that comes from from that environment yeah. So my dad is actually uh, graduated from the University of Minnesota. Okay, and in uh, agronomy. Okay. And so he was also a salesman for uh, seed and fertilizer sure. while doing the farming thing. And when I was, I want to say, 13 or 12, he stopped doing the farming stuff and just rented out the equipment and the land and went into selling seed and fertilizer full time. Sure. And so I got... You know, we lived on the farm the whole time I was there, but we weren't actually engaged in farming sure. the whole time. But I, you know, there was, I had all the, I had all the chores, you know, yeah. picking the eggs and take care of the pigs and feeding the horses. And so there's, I got, I got a taste. Enough to learn enough discipline to get yeah. into the army at least. So. Yes. Yeah. What was West Point like? Uh, it was very difficult. Yeah. Um, but it was very uh, rewarding in the sense of, especially looking back now, um, you know, the Holy Spirit's forming you for your vocation your whole life. Yeah. And I didn't find this out until later, but uh, actually the design of the buildings of West Point were actually designed of a Salesian monastery in France. No way. Yeah. And uh, so it, it, it was very difficult, but it was very good. And, and everyone that graduates from West Point is, is um, at graduation, they're commissioned as an officer in the military. Sure. And so their whole thing at West Point is, is leadership. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's in the water. It's, everything you do is, is oriented that way. And so, um, you know, translating that into where I am now, you know, I'm, I'm very excited to eventually, you know, God willing, become a pastor just so I can use those gifts that I hmm. learned back then, you know, in the religious ministry. Yeah. Yeah, I can you can see the building blocks that God's put in your life for sure. Yeah, it's like every second of your day basically spoken for when you're when you're at a service academy like that, more or less. Or yeah, it's kind of it, just the yeah. The it, life. You know, it's uh, for me coming into the seminary was a breeze <laughs> of a transition. And yeah, I, and I, you know. I talked to head classmates when I started a long time ago. They were like, man, I don't know if I can get up and, and pray every day yeah. <laughs> at, you know, seven or whatever it is. But, you know, coming from, so at, at West Point, you know, you have, um, it's called a formation, not formation like in a seminary, standing in formation, <laughs> a box, you know, standing outside, taking accountability, making sure everybody's there and they're in the right uniform before you go to the next thing. We would do that at least three times a day, usually five. And so having like a set schedule of like, be here at this time to do this thing every day 
I was, you know, it was it was difficult in high school when I when I started. Yeah. But going from that to the seminary nature, yeah. with the liturgy of the hours, I was like, oh, this is great. It's, yeah. It's 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 routine. It's simple. You know, and, and it's just like, yeah. So yeah. It there's a, there's a lot of of uh, crossover as far as like the discipline of the military and then the discipline of like prayer life and then particularly like monastic life as mm. well. So. Yeah, what are some of the other parallels you've seen? Uh, I guess the biggest one would be um, just kind of the engendered sense of sacrifice. Yeah. Um, you know, nobody nobody signs up to be in the military to potentially go to war because they like war. Right. You know, they go because they have they feel like they have a sense of duty and they are loving of what they have and they want to continue to protect that and so they're willing to sacrifice certain things in order to, you know, serve others. Hmm. Um, I don't know what the statistic is now, but at at one point, maybe 5 6 years ago, there was a strong um, statistic. I want to say it was like 11% of all vocations in the U.S. had some connection to the military, whether wow. it be like the man himself or his parent family, or a family yeah. member. Because, And the, the theory is that it's that sense of sacrifice because, you know, the priesthood is sacrificial just by, by its nature. And so when you have the, the sacrificial nature of just being in the military, it's pretty easy to see how the two correlate. Yeah. What was the hardest thing you had to do, either at West Point or during active duty? Hmm. Um, I would say having to hold people accountable, um, yeah. especially as a young officer. So the way the way that it's set up. Um, in the military, you got you got enlisted, and you got officers, and officers superior to enlisted in rank, and they have kind of the um, legal responsibility, effectively as your boss. Sure. And as a young officer, as a as a brand new lieutenant, you know, I was 22 years old, and I was the boss of a bunch of soldiers that were almost all of them older than me. Yeah. <laughs> and so trying to, you know, be in command and and be in charge of them was a very was very difficult um, yeah. since they had so much more just life experience right. than I did, especially in the military. So that was that was a big challenge. How'd you navigate that? Um, I had a lot of good uh, older officers that were good mentors for me. And then some also some older NCOs as well that were that were um, just a great source of advice on how to you know how to navigate and be in charge, but also recognize like yeah you got to be humble because literally everyone in the room knows more than you about what their job is. Yeah, and you know you're still in charge, and so that yeah. you got to navigate that that tension of of humility, but also you know, when it comes down to it, you're the one that's responsible. So sure. it's, a, it's a unique system, and, it, and it's, it's not exactly the same in many other militaries, but the idea is where you would have a, a young officer who's got, you know, some zeal and knowledge and training, and you would pair him with an older senior NCO who has a lot more experience, and they would work together in, sure. in tandem so that... You know, the officer who's got all the, the book knowledge and the training gets tempered with the guy who's got the yeah. experience. Here's, so. how, here's how it works out. In yeah, the here's, here's how we, we've done it for the last 12 years. What's your good idea? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Puts you in your place pretty quick, I yeah. imagine. You did five years of active duty? Yep. Where did that bring you? I know you're stationed a couple different places. Yeah, so, so uh, graduated West Point. I was there for a few months for a summer assignment, and then I went to... Uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, for um, field artillery officer training, and I was there for um, seven, eight months. And then after that, I went to my first duty assignment, which was Fort Wainwright, Alaska, um, which is where I was there for almost um, 
yeah, it would have been the rest of my rest of my t my first five years. So a little over four four years. Okay. So and you were deployed. Yeah. Twice? So I I was went I went on one deployment to uh, Japan and Korea for a couple of months for a, okay. for a training mission. Yeah. Whereabouts in Japan and Korea were you? Uh, let's see. We were in Japan first, and we were in the north. Okay. In uh, there was a place called Ojo Jihara Training Center, which was just maybe 70 miles, something from Sendai, uh, Sendai City. Um, it's kind of in the, I want to say, north central part of Japan. Yeah. And then um, after that, we went to Korea. Uh, I was in Yongsan, which was near Seoul for sure. about a week, 10 days, and then we were up. Um, actually, we were kind of all over the place because it was kind of a national training exercise in, with the Korean military. Okay. And so we Like you were training them? Uh, were no, we were... Training together? Yeah, so it was, like a, it was like a national Korean military exercise, and we were just there in, you know, as an exercise in the event that we, the Americans needed to send more troops sure. to, to Korea because there's... there's there's American troops that are stationed permanently in Korea, and we would be just assuming like if there was something happened where they needed to send a whole bunch more, sure. and we could you know integrate and work with the the native Korean military and and you know assist them in whatever they were doing. So um, it was it was interesting uh, driving around because you know in the U.S. kind of we have um, dedicated lots of land that's just for, for military training exercises. But over, over there, they don't have as much land. And so, you know, we're driving down the middle of the countryside in the middle of villages and streets and stuff with just normal Korean life going on. So it was, yeah. it was interesting. Did you get to kind of get immersed in the culture a little bit? You were, it sounds mm -hmm. like you're moving around a lot. So yeah. it's different than if you were. Not you know, really. You hear of guys who are stationed in the same place for... Yeah, years and years and not really we had um i had a translator who was yeah. attached to me and you know whenever we would do something some joint activity or whatever um we would plan and coordinate and work through the, through the translator but we didn't get a whole lot of of uh contact with any of the local culture it's mostly just their military folks sure. so sure yeah. what's a field artillery officer do so field artillery uh, refers to cannons. Kay. So really, really big cannons that shoot a long ways. Um, and an, as an officer, you're the one that supervises the firing of said cannons, sure. and particularly also the, the, the targeting and where, so where the shooting of the cannons happens, but also where the impact of the rounds land. And so um, at, on that deployment, I was a platoon leader, and I was in charge of three, a three howitzer platoon, uh, so three, three cannons um, and about 40 guys and hmm. trucks and a bunch of other stuff. And these cannons are, um, they, they fire projectiles that are about 100 pounds. Gosh. And they, yeah. can sh they can shoot them, you know, up to like 18 miles. Wow. So... You know they're big and slow, but they can yeah. they they pack a punch. Yeah, when you need them. No kidding. I get a little anxious when I get in my car and my kids are in the back. Like I'm responsible for these lives. <laughs> like, what is it like bearing, you know, that much responsibility? You're in a simulated setting, obviously, but yeah. you're you're in charge of of people and making sure that that these very powerful tools of war are used. Yeah, um, correctly. For lack of a better term. I would I would say it's everything that's that doesn't matter just falls away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you really, you You're really, the... yeah. I, you know, you really focus on what are the basics and what is important. And if it's not important, it forget it. Forget it. Yeah, it's gone. Yep. Huh. Um, and especially especially when you're in an environment that where you don't know kind of all the different logistical nodes. Um, yeah, I was just, I was very, I was very fortunate. Um, nobody got hurt. 
um, which is always a, a major concern when you're deployed because it's like you don't know what the medical resources mm, are available, sure. um, that type of stuff. Um, I had I had a couple of uh, uh, Red Cross messages come in while we were deployed, which is strange, but um, we were gone for two months, and during that time I had two Red Cross in just my platoon. A Red Cross message is basically when um, – a soldier has a family member who is who dies or is imminently about to die, and they send a message to the military, and the military will, will honor that and say, if your family member is about to die, you can go home, go home and, yeah. and, and check it out. So, oh. um, yeah, it's it. You know, I learned a lot, learned a ton about myself um, and about leadership in general. And actually, now that I, now that you mentioned this, I had another kind of a uh, a God moment when I was in Korea, I had learned kind of what the Eucharist was later in life. And at, when, we was, when we were on deployment, I, um, you know, I, I kind of just come out of a, a fervor. I was really starting to really get into my faith and practice it more. And we didn't have a Catholic chaplain with it, so I didn't know like when there was going to be mass and stuff. Hmm. And providentially, randomly, uh, one day we were in we were in Korea in some place, and it was it was in October, so or November, because it was raining continuously. And so, but we had a local priest who heard there's American soldiers there who were, wanted to have Sunday mass, and so I just I was like, oh, there's there's mass, oh, great. Yes. yeah, I get to go, yeah. And so I I figure out where it's at. I find the tent. You know, we're we're up to our ankles in mud, and and you know it's in a tent, and there's probably only like maybe a dozen of us there and, and never, never met the priest before. Uh, he was an American chaplain. He might've been air force actually. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, but anyways, uh, during mass right after, um, the consecration, he comes to, um, distribute communion and he, he beckons me over and he just hands me the Saboria. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? I, like I literally, I almost dropped it. I was like, Oh, oh my, my gosh. gosh. Like you, what and do what? and yeah. and you know reflecting on that later, I was like, because he didn't he didn't tell me anything beforehand, didn't know anything. He just says, "Hey, come here," and he just handed it to me, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, what happened?" And you know, looking wow. back now, it's like, yeah, that priest didn't know me from anybody, but he was like, "I can give this guy Eucharist, and he can give it to other people." I was like, huh. "That's probably a a good indication yeah. of a priestly vocation." Oh, what a beautiful sign, yeah. So, were you raised Catholic? I was. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Irish, really German. St- yeah, sure. Yep. But really started taking the faith seriously, would you say, while you were in the military? or? Um, was that you know, it's, it's, it's complicated. I, uh, we went to Sunday Mass growing up. We did all of the Catholic things, but we yeah. never talked about what they sure. meant. Um, and I, I stopped going to church in college and... Um, I don't remember exactly at what point, but at a certain point after being in Alaska, my first duty assignment, um, I started really questioning like why I was doing what I was doing and really started asking some deeper questions and then eventually sought out, you know, a parish and started going back to mass. Um, And yeah, in that too, like, Particularly, my unit that I was with and the and the soldiers that I was in charge of had been deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan um, two years of the previous five, and the so the guys that you were dropped in and, and put in charge of. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow. And so, just in the midst of that, I ended up having a lot of one-on-one conversations. Um, professional counseling where, you know, I, you're not doing your job. Why aren't you doing your job? This type of stuff. And over and over, I would, I would recognize, you know, these guys don't need a boss. They need somebody to talk to. Mm. And so I recognized in my heart, you know, this desire to be more of a spiritual father to them rather than to be their boss. Mm. And so that was like, okay, I thought I was going to be in the military to be a, you know, to be an army officer and be a leader, 
maybe I'm called to be something else. Maybe I'm called to be a chaplain. And so um, that, that was kind of a significant point where I was like, okay, if this is, you know, what I think I should be doing, how would that actually look? And so, when, mm. so I, at a certain point I was like, okay, I'm Catholic. I should probably go talk to a, talk to a chaplain and be like, what does it take to become a chaplain? And uh, I'll never forget Father, Father James Peak, who's my, my chaplain at the time, and I was like, hey, how do you become a, a, a chaplain? He's like, well, what religion are you? I'm Catholic. And he says, well, you got to be a priest first. And I was like, how do you become a chaplain without being a priest? <laughs> I was like, well, Is if you're Catholic, you can't. Yeah, I was, I was like, I want to get, get married and, and have a family. How do I do that and yeah. become a chaplain? He's like, well, uh, the church doesn't allow... Um, permanent deacons to be chaplains because the greatest need from Catholic chaplains is the Eucharist sure. and confession. And so I was like, oh, well, that's a much bigger question, like <laughs> priesthood, rather than just kind of a, a lateral transfer to a different job description. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. But you're open to it, obviously. I mean, maybe not at first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it, I was very resistant. Yeah. Um, but you know, at, at the same time, I was asking, you know, kind of those questions. I was, I was very uh, desiring more as far as, like, meaning for what I was doing. And so, like I said, I was, I was getting more involved in, in my parish. Um, I ended up joining the Knights of Columbus because they had a great group of men that would do, you know, good works. And I was just like, I want to be a part of that. Yeah. And um, joined the Knights of Columbus they handed me a rosary, and I was like, what's the rosary? And I started praying the rosary, and that mm. started changing my life even more. And, you know, it was, it was one of those things that um, it just never went away. You know, I, I got to the point where, like, okay, I don't think I want to be a field artillery officer the rest of my life, but what do I yeah. want to do? And so I made my, I'm a list guy. I would list out, you know, everything that I could do, potentially want to do. And then I could do, you know, do research, like what it would actually look in real life for me to do this instead of what I'm doing now. And always at the bottom of the list was <laughs> go to seminary and yeah. priesthood, question mark. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, it just, it, it, it never went away. And uh, eventually, you know, through getting involved in the, in the parish and the Knights of Columbus, I ended up going to a... Um, I, uh, I think it was a young adult event or something, and uh, I picked up a copy of uh, Father Brett Brandon's book, To Save a Thousand Souls, which is basically like a how to discern diocesan priesthood. Mm. And I was like, okay, you know, I'll, I'm doing all the research for all these other things. You know, I was going to like go be a firefighter, go be a pilot, go sell insurance, you know, all these different things, and like doing all my homework on what each of those would look like before I kind of make a big life decision. So I was like, okay, it's on my list. I'll read, you know, what's a book? You know, yeah. whatever. I read the book in two days. <laughs> you ate it up. I ate it up. I ate it up. And, and when I finished it, I was like, okay. I need to talk to somebody about wow. this. I yeah. just, I don't, I don't know what it is. Like, I got to talk to somebody. Huh. And so I found, I found a priest who put me in touch with the vocation director in Fairbanks. And, you know, we started, we started talking. Um, and throughout those conversations, kind of over the course of a year, um, they had started this uh, house of discernment in, in Fairbanks, which is basically for young men who are thinking about seminary but not quite ready to apply. Mm -hmm. Maybe they were in college or they had a part-time job or a full-time job but, but wanted to, um, you know, get to know a priest more because it's basically just a house for the vocation director and seminarians to live in. Um, and so he invited me to come join him and stay at the house, and I turned him down twice because I didn't think I could live up to his expectations about, you know, being present for meals and mass and that type of stuff because I was still full-time active duty. yeah. And uh, after the second time he turned me down, the third time he set me up for dinner with the bishop, who just happened to be Bishop Chad Zielinski, who is now the Bishop of New Ulm, and who also happened to be a retired Air Force chaplain. And so when, uh, when he sat me down and said, hey, you know, I'm not saying you're going to be a seminarian. I'm not saying you're going to be a priest. I'm just saying 
that we want to get to know you better and see if this, you know, maybe this is in the Lord's plan and, and it's a good fit. Yeah. You know, we just, we should find out there's pretty low commitment. And I was like, okay, that's, you know, that's nice. And then, because he, he had known I was in the military and I had a desire to be a chaplain. And, and then he told me, oh, by the way, uh, if, you know, you're called to be a seminarian and a, and a priest and you want to serve in the military, I will support you in that because he had, uh, as an Air Force chaplain, deployed with the Army twice. And so he, he was very familiar with mm. the need for priests in the military. And so, I mean, even at that point, you know, I didn't, I wasn't fully aware of the reality of priest shortages, but I was like, you know, it, it, it clicked that, you know, if he's willing to support me all the way through seminary and then just give me up to the military, that, that's a pretty big, you know, support. And so yeah. it was like, that was, that was kind of the, the final straw. I was like, like okay, I got to take this okay, seriously I'm gonna now. Be, yeah, so, it, it, yeah it, it, was, it was the point where I was like, okay, it's basically being handed to me in my lap. Huh. If I don't at least like take the next step, I'm always going to wonder sure. if I wasn't supposed to, you know, try this out. So, yeah. So anyways, moved into the house, for, uh, the sermon house. I lived there for about six months. I was physically there for only about three because I was gone training. And in that time, you know, I was like, well, I'm here. I might as well start the paperwork. You know, it's, it'll, you know, easiest thing to discern of somebody. Oh, the paperwork didn't make it through. Oh, all right. Guess I'm not called. Yeah. Uh, but that didn't happen. So <laughs> I, I, I passed the psyche eval, passed all the stuff. I was accepted to, to the seminary and everything. And, and, and um, I was like, this is like, in the bureaucracy, the church has lots of bureaucracy, but so does the military. When when that paperwork like that goes through on the first time yeah. without any kickbacks or, yeah. or, or edits or anything, like, it was it weird. was I was like this that doesn't happen. That's yeah. weird, but that's what happened. And so I was like, well, it's March. I'm accepted to the seminary. Now what? And my my bishop looked at me. He's like, well, you've been going pretty hard for the last 10 years. Why don't you just take a break, do whatever you want, show up at seminary in the fall, call me once in a while and check in. So, <laughs> which was, uh, in hindsight, a huge blessing because I got to, I, I rode my motorcycle south from Alaska back down to Minnesota and got to reconnect with my family. And huh. I uh, did some more road trips and, and showed up at seminary in the fall of, of, uh, 2017 at uh, Mundelein in Illinois, and yeah, after my first semester there, I was like, okay, I don't know what the priesthood is about or what this is, but I know that I'm supposed to be here. Wow, it was yeah, I, my it was that certain it was that, that it was that easy. Yeah, I I had, I had fought yeah fought tooth and nail to not get in, but then once I once I was like, all right, guess I'm doing it, and then once I got there, I was like. There, there's no more questions. I was like, this mm. is this is where I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to do, and I don't entirely know what that means, but it it's it's the right thing. Yeah. And then you were at Mundelein for six years, and then transferred here to St. Paul for yeah, just your final year here. Yep. Home stretch. Yep. So um, normally, I would have gone to Mount Angel, but at the time. Uh, Mundelein was offering a scholarship for missionary diocese. And so that's why I ended up coming there, uh, which again was providential because it's very cl- you know, six hour drive to where my family was. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, about two years ago, you know, the Lord made it really slowly, painfully clear that, you know, as much as I, as I loved um, the missionary work and the people and the, you know, all the challenges in Alaska, um, he wasn't asking me to do that. He was mm-hmm. asking me to be to be happy and be fully joyful in a place that was uh, closer to my family because they still, you know, wanted the Lord wanted me to have a greater connection with my family. Mm-hmm. And so, um, started you know praying with the spirit director and be like, hey, this is what's coming up. What does this mean? And he's like, okay, well, we'll pray about it. And eventually through a long process, talked to my formator and, and then the vocation director, and about, uh, I think it was 
November of 22, um, I applied to transfer to my home diocese, Diocese went on in Rochester. And again, you know, that was, that was another point where I was like, this is all in your hands, Lord, because I knew at that point it's not typical to transfer diocese yeah, when you're in rare. third theology. Yeah. And, you know, if you, if you leave, there's no guarantee you're going to get picked up. And if you do, you know, you, you might have to do another pastoral year so they can get to know you, whatever. But um, I was very fortunate uh, in that uh, Bishop Aaron had just been made bishop of the diocese when on Rochester, and he had also previously been the rector at Mundelein, so he knew all the people that were in charge of my formation, and so I had... Yeah, that all timed out nicely. Yeah, it, I was you. like, yeah. I couldn't have planned the better if yeah. I tried. Um, and so he was very gracious, and, and you know, nice, he was great, and was willing to accept me um, very, very quickly. And when I met with him and he officially informed me that he was going to accept me, um, I asked to go to the seminary where, and I didn't know where the rest of the seminarians were at the time, I asked to go to the seminary where all my diocesan brothers would go so that I could get to know them in my final year um, before ordination. So, and the bishop said, yep, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> and uh, we just worked it out with the, the seminaries and that's how I came to St. Paul Seminary. Yeah, and so you'll be, here in 24 days, ordained a priest of the Diocese of Winona, Rochester, but the yes. plan is for you to go right into no chaplaincy, or, or do you have to, what, what's that process like? Yeah, so um, I'm in what's called the Seminarian Co-Sponsorship Program okay. through the AMS, which is the, the Archdiocese for the Military Services. And what that is, is the AMS pays for half of seminary education costs, and in return, I agree, and my bishop agrees to let me serve on active duty as a chaplain for five years. That five years doesn't begin until after I have three years' experience in the oh, diocese. Okay. Um, because once you, once you go on active duty, you don't have the same type of, of uh, support as you do at a, at a normal parish. You're not, you, yeah, so you need to have you know, some experience at a parish and be very sure. competent in your skills and set in your priestly identity because you can get sent into places that are challenging yeah. without a lot of support. So, yeah. so I'll, be, I'll be ordained, and then I'll be in the diocese of Winona Rochester somewhere in southern Minnesota for, for three years doing um, parish ministry or whatever the bishop wants me to do before I go back on active duty. Are you a naturally patient person? <laughs> had to be, it seems like you've had to be patient through a lot of this. I mean, we all uh, do in some ways, but I I aspire to be <laughs> to be a naturally patient well, don't person. Don't we all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's you know I I would say um, I'm very patient until I'm not. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> some things some things are are easy to be patient with. Some things yeah. are not. But it's it's uh, yeah. Once, kind of like what I said before, you know, once I decided, like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to decide to try and figure out what seminary is life yeah. for me. Yeah. And I'm going to find definitively that that's not what I'm called to do. And then I'm going to go back to do whatever I want to do yeah. in the first place. And that never happened. You got the opposite. So once I, yeah, once I decided, yeah. I was like, all right, I'm, I'm all in, whatever, you know, whatever it takes, whatever okay, I don't understand, but yeah. so, and, and I guess part of that comes with the military experience too. It's like, cause it's a lot of hurry up and wait and, mm. you know, you get orders yeah. and then the yeah, orders you... change and then they change again. And so there's a lot of, uh, I'm, I would say I'm, I'm familiar with the unknown of, yeah. of yeah. life. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah. You've been tested. That could be hard for us as men, right? We want to <laughs> control everything, fix everything. You've had, to, yep. you've gotten good practice at letting go. Yes, yes, which is admirable. So, yeah. so like having Bishop Barron as a as a bishop. Oh, it's great. He's, uh, you know, we don't get a ton of FaceTime with him. I would say I I don't know what normal is, but when yeah. I was when I was in Fairbanks, I was the only seminarian, so I could. Oh, right. Really? I, I was hanging out with my bishop all the time. It's very different now, and it's great 
because yeah. I have 24 seminarian brothers. But um, yeah, no, Bishop Barron, he, he brings such, you know, good energy and like focus on we're doing the mission of Christ, mm. you know, very, he's very rigorous in the intellectual tradition, you know, encourages, uh, encourages rigorous study, which I think is, is needed and great. Um, and he's, I mean, he's a phenomenal preacher, which I think is oh, yeah. a huge part of priestly ministry. And so it's great to have a, you know, my, my spiritual father just leading a great example of what it looks like to proclaim the good news. Yeah. Obviously so many people know him from his word on fire ministry, but I think when you kind of analyze the big picture, just how he's, he's never let that, it seems like get in the way of his first duties as, as a bishop, as yeah. a spiritual father to you, to other seminarians, to his diocese, whether it was in yep. like super urban California or Minnesota farm country, like he always seems to kind of put the first things first, which I don't know that everyone always sees that or knows that, but yeah, you kind of have a front row seat to that, huh? He, he's very, he's very faithful and very humble to the church. And yeah. that was one of the things that was kind of a concern when I found out he's going to be the bishop because it's like, well, if he's going to be doing word on fire stuff, how, is he going to have time necessarily to, to have, you know, give his attention to the diocese? But, um, I think he's done a, a great job so far and he he legitimately does have a lot of responsibilities through through word on fire and then also just with his involvement in the greater church he's been at this at the synod and he'll be going yeah. back again in the fall and so it's right you know it's not something i'm super excited about but because he's going to be gone and, yeah. and, and stuff but at the same time it's like the holy father has asked him and he has said yes and that is you know, what more could you want yeah. from, from your, from your shepherd, you know, being obedient to the church? Um, yeah. Cause I mean, even, even when he is over there, you know, he's, st- we, you know, the priest, the priests know him and he has, I think a good, a good rapport with the priest. And so it's, yeah. And, and his, he says this at almost every mass he's at, he's like, my two goals are, uh, evangelization and vocations. Yeah. And so he's, he's like, he wants to double the number of vocations, which if he keeps, keeps going the way it is like it's probably going to happen here in the next year or two i remember watching his like introductory press conference that was one of the first things he said mm-hmm. which working in the seminary world was yep. was pretty cool to hear you know yeah. that that a leader like that is prioritizing that so and it's also it's great to as a as a seminarian to have him as a bishop because he knows seminarians and he's you know oh, yeah. he's involved in their lives and their formation and 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 all this stuff um having been a professor for, I don't know, 15 years yeah. and then a rector. So yeah, he's, he's, he's very aware and present to what's going on in seminary formation and seminary life. Yeah. Praise God. One more and we'll get you out of here. Is, is there one or two things that you're most looking forward to post-ordination other than just like being done with finals obviously <laughs> i'm asking you this at a weird time i know because you've yeah. got just a couple weeks left here but you know come this summer you'll you'll have had ordination and you know you'll you'll be a priest when you kind of look a couple months into the future what do you see yeah um one of the things that i've grown to love since in a seminary is and especially you know being out in public wearing a collar, people will come and ask you to pray for them. Mm. And sometimes they will, you know, either write it down or hand you or ask your phone number and really share with you some very personal struggles with with the Lord, with their family, with health stuff, you know, all kinds of stuff. And it's uh, it's happening multiple times where it's just like, I don't know this person very well, and they're just... They're just sharing their heart with me. I'm like, Lord, I don't know what's going on right now, but I'm I'm here. I'm I'm doing what I think you want me to do. Um, and you know, as a as a seminarian and as a deacon, you know, obviously, you can pray with them in that moment and then pray for them afterwards. Um, but I'm so excited to be able to bring the power of the sacraments into people's lives. Um, you know. I just had a rec- very recently. I had a I had a, a good friend call me and, and let me know that he had been to confession for the first time in a long time, and and he wants to come back to the church and get his kids baptized. And wow. 
And, you know, it's just like, that's, that's the goal right there. Yeah. Is bring, bring God into people's lives and help people come into the life of the church where they can, can be closer to God. Um, I'm planning, I'm planning to go back to, um, Fairbanks later this summer and offer masses of Thanksgiving for all the people that supported me yeah. while I was up there. Um, I'm very excited about that just because they were so good to me for so long. Um, yeah. And just, you know, getting involved into the, all the different things of parish ministry, you know, it's, it's, it, it really is going to be an adventure because, you know, you, you study and you're like, okay, this is how you do this and pastoral formation. And, but it's it's still never the same as the real thing, it's you not know. Theoretical when anymore. somebody comes into yeah. your office and they're like, "Hey, Father," yeah, it's like, "Okay, <laughs> this is go. real." Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to bringing, bringing the Lord to wherever He wants me to take Him. Amen. In people's lives. Well, thank you for your service, and thank you for your service to the <laughs> to our country and to the church. And we'll we'll be excited to see where where God takes things from here. Thanks, Phil.